Um, but it really matters the important thing about the set of issues we're going to hear about is how Brexit is not just, despite the way it feels, a kind of continual series of loud noises and weird one-off events and strange things that have come out of nowhere that we don't know where it will end up. They are part of a wider historical and uh, social and, and institutional uh, set of events uh, which tackle in a variety of really uh, interesting ways. Um, so I'm going to teach uh, what we are, what I'm going to do after you spoke for about five minutes. I will generally tap with my agreement on that glass table. I realize I may not ask you how to get toy play with. Uh, I'm just kind of like that. If you keep going on for seven minutes and start hitting the glass table, <laughs> up until the point where you stop, or my hand goes through glass. Uh, so please do stop quite quickly because I've only got two sets of hands and there are considerably more than uh, two of you. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to speak to the guys and talk about how, uh, speak to us well. First one, we're going to talk to, us, talk to us about how the impact of Brexit has strengthened ethnic identities uh, within the United Kingdom and what that means uh, for the United Kingdom. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, well, in a sense, my um, point of my talk is not so much about how Brexit has strengthened this sense of identity, but uh, how these identities have become more important for the political process. And uh, as a representative of uh, PSA, especially the uh, politics, I found it remarkable that after Brexit, on the future of the country has so been uh, rarely uh, debated because it is a British interest that have been on stage in these debates. When uh, David Cameron and political defenders of his job since have put forward straight the interest of the British people, um, then uh, um, we made a clear shortcut to uh, appeal to voters on the ground. Might not appear to be a particularly uh, uh, questionable shortcut, but there is one that. Uh, for us to see here in London, but in the world where uh, I look at things, it is. And up until that, there's no new land in the Protestant state for Protestant people, and uh, though um, the new land was on trials forgotten during the Brexit campaign in 2016, um, it did vote leave. On the Bay Islands in Scotland, the vote also was returned to May. And since that has been presented as a testimony of Scotland's uh, difference from the rest of the UK, and indeed with the last indicators, why segments of uh, the society in Scotland disidentified uh, from being British. Perhaps uh, the thoughts on the electoral metrics is charged. But uh, we would uh, have been part of that lot if uh, the biggest uh, opinion poll in the UK's UK history would have been truly representative. We do not really know uh, for sure that Welsh voters cast about because they want to have a less meditate because from Brussels. Neither can we be certain uh, that uh, Londoners voted to remain in the best interest of the UK. There is some evidence known that uh, political ground Brexit um, and to the outcomes reflect the dark, deeper, ethnocentric psyche of the British uh, public. But we should not assume that all those who voted to leave wanted to take this in place again. In fact, we know very little of the voters who voted up to four. We know the less about the impact that uh, uh, the roads will have in the relation between people and the peoples of this union. Brexit was not only a good relationship between London and Brussels' uh, success, it also shines the light on different views of the country, of the country uh, in different parts of this kingdom. Particularly the attitude of UK elites uh, to preferences as well, she's Scottish, and those uh, uh, from the islands unrepresented by the UP is a bit of this. What allows me most in this context is that the opportunity and the outcome of the Brexit referendum has provided for phenomenon. That is, for those who are not in a position to make a reversal decision, Brexit offers an excuse to project their ethnocentric views. The answer to the attitudes and uh, views on people not from here and made to the allies of the North, uh, but fundamentally, Brexit is set by political entrepreneurs, <coughs> those who feel themselves in the position of minority, 
to emphasize their ethnic rather than their social dimensions. And in order to convince their followers, it is the representatives of non English nations in the UK who drive the wedge between their English and their own constituents. Discussions were elected often appeal to the shared interests of uh, the people, that are well as the machinations of uh, their ethnic enemies. Both the rulers and the members have pursued the strategy of ethnic differentiation to further their own group, and that is their group's interests. Those in control of the British state, as well as those involved uh, administrations and youth referendum, results as a uh, um, status <laughs> of Britishness, Scottishness, Welshness, Northern Irishness. Uh, in Cardiff, Edinburgh, and South Wales, where the South Wales sits in Belfast, the principle of ethno national that the British government has been the driving force behind the political process in the past years. And it is uh, the belief that. The rights should be representing the rights that also run underlies the Brexit referendum campaign. In the current up to the referendum, the principle of national representation has been central to taking back control. And in the same sense of that national representation, UK's constituent peoples can now demand more independence for their own. Or at least, fair representation that is more than just a hearing where decisions by existing UK governments. Well, that have a profound impact on them. And so, during the next world, it's in the constituent parts of the kingdom crafted their electorate to speak to their electorates as if uh, these were homogenous, cultural, social, and political subjects. This implies that everyone is in this together for those uh, electorates. And every part of Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish communities is affected by momentous and, as is often uh, assuming self centered will of the English. The fact that those really Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland have the fear of these, their own representatives in their absence, as well as in Westminster, makes it particularly easy to claim that they represent their people. But whereas Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland might have the semblance of a nation state, not only within the UK at the moment, it is the English who have a disproportionate say over political decisions and political on the entire territory of this union. In the absence of dedicated legislature for the English part of the kingdom, England's MPs have only one forum where they can debate their differences, this is Westminster Parliament. There, they also drive the rest of the kingdom into their debates, and as is clear today, when TP pops up from Majesty's government, have a good chance of imposing the terms of a uh, Parts of regional electorate on the UK context at large. Turning the English rules for English laws on the Senate, that would mean to limit English patronage on the British and UK in general politics, and therefore would welcome, would be a welcome step uh, for revisiting, re revisiting how the UK works. Having failed to legislate that earlier, we have seen the English Minister of Class repeating itself in the aftermath of the referendum. We have seen the word reference of the use of British where English is involved. But this is a red header. British does not preclude English shoulders over a constituent class of the Union. What it does, though, it does set off non British from having a say in Brexit debates. And thus it appears the representatives of the British people are not only pushing the new country out of the EU. In that sense, the American majority of the votes cast in favour of the elite across Britain, they consolidate the boundary between those who have done so and pass the test of Britain being British and others. Others who have not voted for British interests outside the EU, who are therefore not British at all. That is why I believe the referendum is by far the most divisive event in recent political history of the Parliament and will have consequences for the internal cohesion of the country. And we are inevitably emerging towards the date set for Brexit, and there are few certainties about the future relationship between the UK and the EU, but people have been set to the rules of uncertainties have a few notions to hold to. Essentially, small governments. Will continue operating in Wales and Europe and also in South America. This will provide forums for local political leaders to discuss local political issues, to caution 
the fallout of uh, outer the EU. These protests can easily become uh, hijacked by those who would like and would prefer that the national political on UK political. And these political methods are likely to be used to uh, uh, rally against the decisions made by the British Parliament where English dominates. And with these conditions, the higher levels of inequality, as we will hear later from my political panelists, um, especially on the sides of projects, uh, are likely to result in more and not less at the political agitation of UK politics. <coughs> higher settlements, cultural environment, and environmental so social clothes groups exist in abundance on these islands. In order to be able to uh, um, those with dedicated access to resources of quasi nation states in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, uh, will have all the incentives to work on their anti English conventions. They will do so, they can do so, to woo the, the voters ejected from the British state and seeking support and comfort closer to home. And giving greater certainty to Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales as separate nations with their own cultural and social political future. The outcome of the Union could be one of those outcomes that we have not anticipated when the Cameron balanced his plans for a uh, uh, referendum. But with 64 days to go to Brexit, it's really a time for us to start thinking about what uh, the future brings for social and political cohesion on these islands. And I'm looking forward to your. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. <coughs> One of the yeah, kind of more shocking follow-up, in some ways, deep down to primary, but also shocking for primaries of the last two years, surely the number of people who said that they would be perfectly willing to, uh, to saw off uh, Northern Ireland if it meant getting the correct Brexit. Uh, I think one of the most revealing trends uh, from a journalistic perspective would be how little the, the majority of our readers in England, Scotland, and Wales care about the demand in one way or the other. Um, the implications of that are one of the major, uh, major repercussions, I think, of the Brexit. Uh, it appears as we've been sociology, these universities are going to talk about that and other things uh, in our presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here representing the Irish Politics Specialist Group, especially as a senior sociologist. Um, so, I don't know if many of you are aware of the fact that academics and pollsters may be, in not too distant future, responsible for the breakup of the United Kingdom. And I'll tell you how this is. So, as part of UK law, if the Secretary of State in Northern Ireland believes that the majority of Northern Ireland would vote in favour of the United Ireland, um, she or he is responsible for holding a referendum on that report. Um, the question is, how would she make a judgment as to whether we would be likely to judge the name or not? How would she, would she accept by looking at uh, opinion polls, in particular survey data and rigorous survey data? And for that reason, I'm going to show you some um, uh, data today from the most reliable source of opinion polling and attitudinal surveys in North Ireland, precisely the North Ireland Back in Time survey, which is the unique example of cross community collaboration in North Ireland and that's between Queen's University and Ulster University, which is quite some achievement. <laughs> so, to begin with, um, the fundamental question let's get straight down to the big one. What does North Ireland Back in Time survey say about whether folks are going to be more likely to want to United Ireland? I have to say, the most recent data for, for NILCH is 2017, so presenting that to you. Um, so, unsurprisingly, really, we see the Catholic um, portion of the population say they're more likely to want to United Ireland. Bear in mind that that 30% is on top of 40% who say that that's what they want anyway. Um, and, for instance, amongst that 40% say they're less likely to want to United Ireland as a result of Brexit. And then we see a trend amongst those with no relations. So that's about 20% of the population in Northern Ireland. Um, increasing polarisation within that group. Um, uh, we see a small trend towards those wanting United Ireland, but it's not particularly clear. And then if you dig more deeply, uh, for example, in the ESRC survey produced by John Gary, 
And you see, perhaps unsurprisingly, that the harder the bracelet, the more likely people are actually want to have the matcha. <laughs> Trying to put this in context and how the tree had is, is significant. Um, basically, this is summarizing 20 years of milk data from Northern Ireland. The big question, of course, the question that both are going to try to resolve, which is, um, <coughs> should Northern Ireland be part of the UK or uh, United Ireland? We see that in some, the UK has been remarkably successful. The majority of people uh, um, want to, uh, quite happy with Northern Ireland being part of the United Kingdom, as well as this evolved status. So, cash sharing within that developed arrangement is absolutely critical to people's trust and confidence in the peace process. Um, and this is true because, particularly, of course, to the, the Catholic population. There is an interesting change then between what happened in 2015 and 2017 because we lost, we had two big events, of course, between those two uh, points. The first is we lost deconviction, it's kind of in suspension or effective suspension. Um, uh, since well, two years now, since uh, January 2016, and then of course we have Brexit. So, we've been asked what's your preferred long term future for Northern Ireland? We see this is the Catholic population that we ask this. And we see between 2015 and 2017, there's a significant increase in the world we see in United Ireland. Um, and notably, in 2015, um, we began to see um, the case the majority of Catholics in Northern Ireland saying that they prefer a country with deviation than the UK. This is a remarkable change. What about from the Protestant respondents? This graph is slightly misleading. Uh, we see a drop in support for direct rule, but what I haven't shown there is the fact that the number of those who say they don't know is significantly increased. This is a kind of way to see. There's a lot going on at the moment. There's a lot going on across the Union of the UK. Let's wait and see what happens. They're holding off uh, in many ways. And then that no religion group, that 20% uh, who could make a critical difference, or would make a critical difference if we were to have a border poll. And there's increased polarization between within that group, um, which is not a good sign, let's just put it that way. Most critically, aside from Brexit, the absence of total government uh, really poses a big problem with all of this. Um, not least because it forces eyes towards London, what's London going to do? But what we've seen um, in the course of Brexit was particularly as an unexpected result of the election in 2017 is the emphasis upon uh, the union and unions and the problem coming from the British government. So she's made language about our precious union. Uh, in some, seems to be overcompensating. Because if you look at the data about what people in Britain think about the organised place in the UK, you have a, you have a much more um, ambiguous, shall we say, picture. This is taken from the World Action Protocols, in which they uh, say, um, if, if it wasn't possible to keep the union intact and have Brexit, what would you prefer? 63% of the Leave voters are saying, well, stop the union, we'll have Brexit, thank you very much. Um, and as has already been uh, referred to, um, in the so in World Action Protocols, then um, most, most folks in Northern and GB don't actually have that much of a view. They say it's up to Northern Ireland itself to be to choose the future. That's all well and good. And then if they leave, they will be too upset about it. It's just, let's just put it that way. Most concerning for us in Northern Ireland is the finding from the future England survey from English D voters saying that 81% of English D voters say they'd be willing to risk jeopardizing the peace process in Northern Ireland in order to secure that Brexit. <laughs> That's what, that's what that language showed. The problem is, of course, the peace in Northern Ireland isn't uh, a fantasy, it isn't a kind of, um, uh, it isn't something that's actually uh, not at risk. The, the, the risk of peace being threatened by Brexit is actually a very real one, and this is partly both centering upon the issue of hard labor. So, two thirds of voters in Northern Ireland across, across all communities say that they think hard labor will increase uh, parliamentary activity and and, and create division in Northern Ireland. And then again, looking at that broad across data, following data, we see that in contrast, uh, uh, GB respondents, two thirds of the voters saying that they're willing to see a hard border in Ireland, and then they uh, say uh, uh, the customs union with the EU. Um, the question then is does Britain really care about North Ireland? Um, and if the answer is no, then this forces unionism and nationalism into very much more hard positions within Northern Ireland. So for unionists, of course, 
is they hold a much more tightly to the union uh, they hold more tightly to Westminster. And if you're the DUP, you milk your particular position of influence and um, infamy for all its work. For the nationalist position, of course, you were doubting the question of uh, the reality of parity of steam, uh, esteem in Northern Ireland. You were very much doubting uh, your ability to trust in the British government. And you might say that it's a much more attractive prospect. So the irony of all this is that in the small part, um, this whole question of polarization of unionism and nationalism, perhaps a very likely bit of your idea that it has been caused by English MPs and English voters. Thank you uh, very much for that. That was sobering but fascinating. Um, <coughs> I recently was speaking to Colin Jones before he sat down his first interview and he likened the impact press on Wales uh, to a meteor strike. One of the sort of odd things about uh, the politics of withdrawal agreement is Despite the fact that the law is supposed to leave, it is said to be hugely affected by it. It's had very little uh, influence and in, uh, role on the, the discussion of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, they speed into the slightly more tidy nature of the new which is one of the relatively low interest in. Uh, so, Matt Wall, who is a uh, senior American policy at the Fulham University, is going to talk about that and its consequences uh, for us now. Okay, uh, I'm to the stage, as long as it start. Um, okay, so my name is Dr. Matthew Wall. I'm actually an associate professor in politics uh, at Swansea University, so I've been promoted since I set the blurb for this talk. Um, and my thing in my talk is lost Welsh for Brexit, and uh, some of you might be able to tell that I'm not actually from Wales, but I have been living in Swansea, and uh, you know, I'm living in Swansea University, it feels like. Uh, I've been living and working in Swansea for six and a half years and just getting to know Welsh politics. So, I want to start off with some kind of general points about the uh, referendum result. And so, the kind of headline figure that most people looked at was the similarity of this result um, to the overall rest of the UK figures, right? So, we had 52.5% choosing to leave, 47.5% supporting to remain. Now, underneath these figures, we also see that they're quite similar when we start to look at the data. Similar demographic drivers and attitudinal drivers again to the rest of the UK. So, things like education, age, income, attitudes towards immigration, all played quite strongly. We can see this in the results, for example, the Remain results in CAR, which probably most notably, also in London, Surrey, and Bennett, and Morgan. Now, surprisingly, the Welsh national identity played a relatively small role when you kind of hold it against those other factors in the vote. Um, but actually, interestingly, British identity, in particularly that's quite a large English contingent living in Wales, English identity were quite strong predictors of, of the vote. So there was kind of a balancing of national identity, um, and, and it seemed to be more about Britishness than Welshness, which is interesting. Now, in Wales, um, the slide title here is the Welsh Brexit vote of Welsh Labour failure. Now, in Wales, there's obviously a strong tradition of, of supporting the Labour Party. So high level of partisan identification of Welsh Labour, public Labour. Um, and the, the, Welsh, the Welsh Labour Party is quite a strong and clear position, arguably a stronger and clearer position than the UK Labour during the campaign. So we can see here a quote from their um, manifesto. <coughs> we would like for Britain to stay in Europe to play a leading role in the reformed union. That messaging is very consistent. But as the headline figures show, they weren't were able to bring enough people with them to win a bad majority for their remaining position. Now, since Brexit, how has the Welsh Labour government been positioning as the introduction um, implied? The positioning doesn't really matter that much, let's face it. So, initially, like, they tried to build alliances. <laughs> so, Welsh Labour built alliances both with Plaid Cymru and the Mark, we give them the notes uh, how much Welsh Labour hates the SMB. The SMB, right, around this notion of a power grab from Westminster, <coughs> right into the withdrawal legislation. So ultimately they resigned from this decision to vote the true in May last year. Now there's been consistent calls, and, and this hasn't been resolved from, for a sort of soft, as soft as possible Brexit, given the kind of unique economic um, sort of pressures that are faced by Wales and that will be driven by a hard Brexit. So the nature of the Welsh economy, the, the role of agriculture, there are all these big companies that are involved in exporting on these very complicated European supply chains. And so there's been an argument that, oh, Wales, 
a hard Brexit would be particularly damaging. And also there's a sort of economic argument that Wales is, is a net um, beneficiary of the European Union only. And this is the global cause of the place lost the EU subsidies. And one of the calls for constitutional realignment, which I mentioned Carl Jones, used to talk about the act of federalism uh, as, as, as something that he was pushing for. <coughs> the National Assembly for Wales, just like everybody else, condemned the withdrawal agreement. But there was a little cut through for this, either in the substance of the negotiation or in space in the popular imagination. And in the last time, part of my talk, I'm going to ask why. So, uh, I like the quiz. And uh, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. So, how many people could confident, confidently name all three of these Welsh political figures? <laughs> <laughs> so, we've got the Welsh politics expert in there. And so, I'm, I'm glad that's what happened because that's what I was hoping would happen. <laughs> um, so, we have some scary figures on the Welsh government centre, right? So, we have here uh, Adam Trice, who's like only leader on top. Gentleman called Paul Davies, who's actually the leader of the Welsh Conservatives, and Mark Bradford, who's actually the First Minister of Wales. And we can see in December 2018 that Paul asked to evaluate these leaders. Look at these don't know figures. You're asked to evaluate a major, you're asked to evaluate the First Minister of your country. 44% of people just don't know. But that indicates that like, they don't know who, who he is, or at least that like, some people don't know who he is. For example, furthermore, there's lots of funny statistics like this. Less than 20% of respondents in the 2016. Welsh election, Welsh national election seats were directly assert the composition of the government that they were to be voted on. Or the third didn't know the health, the single biggest spend is involved. Um, and why is this? Well, basically because if you live in Wales, it's basically like living in Surrey. Right? So unless you're really into Welsh politics, there's not really a lot in the, in the media, or there's not a lot of people following the media that call, follows Welsh politics. So four times as many people read the um so called the Daily Telegraph. As the, as the Western Mail, or Daily Mail as the Western Mail in Wales, right? But when our news comes on after the news, and it's always a story about a dog getting lost on the beach, and that's fine. Okay? <laughs> so, and obviously, the coverage that we get here in the UK, uh, consistent with my quiz, is somewhat lacking. Let's face it. So, we have this kind of existential crisis, right? The three falls in the woods, and no one hears it, doesn't make a sound. I know that's one of the graduate students to follow that question. And the most equivalent is that if the National Assembly for Wales takes a strong position on Brexit, which it has won, but no one cares about it either in or beyond Wales, doesn't really matter politically. So, what's Welsh for Brexit? This is an interesting question. I talked to two Welsh people this morning and they didn't know. Uh, two Welsh speakers, two Welsh lecturers in the university. So, I, I heard two people either say it's Brexit or just the word Brexit. So, the point is. <laughs> Brexit means Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> and Welsh Brexit is basically British Brexit. That's my, that's my fundamental point. But this is, for me, hugely problematic. Because, as I said, Wales, Wales does face a disproportional downsides from certain kind of Brexit configurations. That, that's pretty much inarguable. And the whole purpose of the National Assembly for Wales is to give voice to these kind of concerns, or at least the major purpose of it. And Spain did say that. And it also, I think, could ultimately destabilize Welsh, and who knows, even British politics. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. That was quite fascinating and chasing me to measure uh, the problem that I realized I couldn't identify the middle, the middle person who had pushed. I think I would have guessed was Nathan Gill. In Brownson, they're not. Uh, uh, which is fine, I realize that no one, no one else knows why that's in Brownson, so it's a really good choice on the view. Yeah, Valley of the Sea is not after an example of a kind of English and non media British difference uh, to a one developed into the other sort of time bomb the record sets on where it is. The unbalanced devolution settlement. Uh, the Scottish Parliament obviously exists, but also in the US there is no equivalent organisation or organisations uh, for England. Uh, what does that mean as we leave the European Union or we don't leave the European Union? Uh, Mark Arnold, the Professor of Public Policy at the University of West of Scotland in the time, and also uh, I'm aware of the reason uh, to have been real well. You could just uh, do the case of us now, please. Thank you.
you very much. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, it's going to be able to talk about comments. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm hearing from the PSA comment group, and my research is kind of the workings of evolution in the UK comment, and why it breaks it. It's one of kind of Scottish issues in terms of asymmetrical evolution as well. Well, we've got an increasingly unsettled constitutional debate going on just now. And what I want to do is try and weave through some of the issues. And bear with me, there's a lot of them in terms of the constitutional spelling and the repercussions potentially for how devolution has worked and asymmetrical devolution in the UK. That poses questions about the topic of the day, the future of the union, and where we're going. Um, so, when you think about the relationships, um, over the past, I said there one, but really could have been the past couple of days as well. Um, we're trying to understand um, the repercussions of the Brexit debate in terms of the practicalities and the workings of devolution in the UK. And obviously, in terms of the constitution, the well constitution and written, um, we've got serious kind of issues in terms of the informal and formal workings of devolution. And a lot of this coming out to do with the governmental kind of issues that we're going to say. But I'll also kind of draw out some of the kind of important issues that Matt talked about as well in terms of accountability and sovereignty, in terms of the rights legislators vis a vis the UK Parliament. And we've had some clashes in terms of intergovernmental. I suspect over the coming weeks we'll see those intensifying in terms of some debates going on in terms of the former Brexit within the Scottish debate and the UK debate. But also, crucially, for the workings of asymmetrical devolution, we need to bring the devolved legislators back into the debate. So, we can say in terms of the UK leaving the EU, that poses questions about the structures, institutions, how we govern ourselves, what does democracy mean within the asymmetrical devolution, and what well, happens to the UK together? Is it the EU frameworks in terms of how the EU has worked? And if we remove the EU blocks and trenched in devolution in terms of various acts across the UK, we could find the agreement. What do you have to replace it? There's also been some debates as well within the Scottish Parliament in terms of legislative consent motions, in terms of the Brexit legislation, and the continuity of legislation and the Supreme Court decisions as well. So the laws came into it as well. So what we should just kind of reflect on is the tension between how asymmetrical devolution works, why are they spilling out into the courts, why are they having to go to that form as opposed to having other mechanisms there. So in terms of Brexit and the Union, as I said, if you remove the EU framework that underpins the Scotland Act 2016, Scotland Act 1998, the Welsh Act, and also the Pacific Union, what comes in this place? And this is where you get the tussles of political and uh, supermarkets, the political crashes between positions to do with common frameworks, how the regulations will work, post devolution, uh, in terms of Brexit, and what may happen in terms of internal markets, trade deals, all of that, and many more. And that kind of teases out the debate as well about a different constitutional and administrative culture underpinning these political debates about what Brexit means for the future and how the government ourselves. So issues about sovereignty have become key to practical political concerns for the parties across the UK, but also to do with how we construct popular sovereignty versus parliamentary sovereignty. And some of that is walking its way through in terms of basic UK common frameworks, in terms of what happens next. And as you can see from the name of the war, there's a lot of views and a lot of people and what happens next. Um, and still trying to distill everything down. Um, we're saying, okay, increasing that sense of constitution, where the constitution of flux, why does that matter? Because increasingly, as weeks go on, we're going to see, in terms of practical politics, the ramifications of constitutional issues are going to come more and more to the fore. That will pose questions, some of the more questions about the constitution, 
reform the House of Lords. Basically, the whole world thinks of it's an extra devolution. We don't have the Speaker and the House of Commons in terms of evil, we mentioned there. All of these are really going to have significant set effects on practical politics and political policy globally. And we haven't yet started the debate properly because over the kind of next few months, 10, 20 years, somebody's been working So, in terms of where we go, you know, the Miller case there, we've also got the Reichman case in terms of the European Court justice decision. In terms of the UK aiming to vote Article 50 without the EU uh, mission. What does that mean in terms of the kind of walkings between the legislatures as well? So we're thinking about constitutional facts. Mm. What happens next? And we really have an open to debate on um, You can look at the, the House of Lords for some kind of debates in terms of, yeah, what are we going next? Because actually, there's been no time. In terms of scrutiny of the EU withdrawal bill, we've got the Acts of Union bill there in the House of Lords. Talking about, yeah, almost a kind of quasi paper system again, in terms of rebalancing the relationship between the four territories and the UK. And that sets the side of what's going to happen in terms of the UK and the UK as well, which has still effects in terms of the walkings of the UK. So, some points to kind of Ways in terms of just kind of more conditions, it kind of opens kind of debates. A lot of the constitutional questions, some of them have been found their way through the Supreme Court, have been because been unsettled, they've been sidestepped by UK governments since 1997 in terms of the operation of the Walking of Devotion to do with political accountability and representation between the law legislators and the UK. So it's forced it up the Westminster agenda, but we can't predict how it's going to play out in the future. The trust has an issue for devolution and Brexit, raise questions about territorial politics in the UK, nationalism, identity, as we've been hearing, questions about new regulation, common frameworks, what happens after Brexit. Okay, we're starting that process, but you can see that that's just the Titch in terms of so much is it's still going to come. So we know it's unsettled. The process of leaving the EU, soft hard Brexit New Deal, we look at different kind of dialogues and narratives going on across particularly the Westminster and Scottish forums that ties into popular sovereignty, parliamentary sovereignty, civic nationalism. Then we're thinking about who does this take us next in terms of interparliamentary relations. Trying to work way through what happens after the meaningful vote, the cross party discussions, the cross parliamentary discussions. Well, <coughs> we're not trying to do it again. Yeah. So, all of this means that there is a real political need to debate and resolve some of these, what seems to be rather dry constitutional issues in the past, are having real practical implications in terms of the workings of policy. In particular, the still over effects between devolved and reserve policy, shared competencies within the UK, and if you remove the EU framework, obviously, which tied all of the union together in terms of the UK union, you haven't had to debate yet about where the constitution is going next. And so there's many more questions, more answers, and we look forward to the discussion in terms of yeah. Things are moving really quickly in some ways, but in other ways, some debates are not really enough to take them to do with it, but we need to revise these new people to go to the right of exit. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think one of the golden threads so far is how much our EU membership was the implicit assumption that it would last forever and underpin so much of the Labour's devolution uh, settlement initially. And of course, that's not the beginning of, uh, of the, the, the story of the power of our constituent cross by United Kingdom and Labour one another. I'm slightly reminded of this uh, coming talk about the Joe Guy case in the editorial meeting, but I can't be bothered to explain why in different parts of the Labour Party around it. To my editor, I'll just lean back and go, ah, well, you see, it starts in 1917 when. The Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, and he always cuts me off at that point. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, but they were except for in politics in the University of Central Bank talk about the, the pre-history as well as the present of of uh, social transfer. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Um, in preparation for this event, I read a book published in the 1970s called The Breakup of Britain by Tom Nair, a very pressing uh, text in many ways. I thought I had to read it, read it before I give this talk today, given today's uh, uh, discussion. What Nair does is place the rise of Scottish nationalism into historical perspective, which I think is really important. Uh, I can't remember the whole Nair thesis here. I'd like to zone in on one particular concept that Nair um, Puts forward, which is the idea of overdevelopment, and try and wake up some of the dilemmas that we face with the Brexit conjuncture today. So let's begin with the 19th century. The 19th century was an era of classic modern nationalism. The French Industrial Revolutions had unleashed shockwaves across European societies. And Tolkien's argument is that nationalism arises as a response to those shockwaves. Groups <coughs> and intellectuals within relatively underdeveloped states, such as Germany and Italy, had to rally mass support in order to restructure their states and societies for development in the face of these new pressures from modernity. The paradox for there, and this is where Scotland comes in, is why did Scotland not experience an organised nationalist movement in the 19th century in common with the European experience? And there is an answer to that, is that Scotland had developed early on, it was integrated in, through the Act of Union in 1707 into the first total capitalist state, and therefore <laughs> Scotland did not experience the um, same pressures as the European side did, and didn't experience the same form of nationalism. Instead, the kind of cultural romant uh, romantic nationalism expressed itself primarily in the 19th century, and right up until the middle of the 20th century, no organised strong political nationalism emerges um, until the 1960s. And what happens in the 1960s and 70s is that we start to see the decline um, of the British post-war model of political economy. We start to see a uh, consistent chronic underperformance of the British economy relative to Germany, the USA, Japan. We see uh, the, the complete collapse of empire in the decade before it and a widespread crisis for British capitalism and British state. At this same moment in Scotland, uh, there is the discovery of North Sea oil in the 1960s. And this creates the potential for what Nairn calls overdevelopment. Indeed, Nairn identifies what he calls a new nationalism to emer emerge in this post war period. The new nationalism, countries like the Basque country in Catalonia and Scotland, not included in this. Are quite, it's quite distinctive from the 19th century model. What happens with the new nationalism is that these are regions of, with relative economic potential. They might have a niche in the market for access to a commodity like oil, like in the case of Scotland. And what this develops is um, a, a desire for a sovereignty relative to the metropole, in Scotland's case, London and Westminster. In other words, a desire to break free from what become a sclerotic partner in the 1960s and 70s crisis. And I would argue that these pressures originally for former for, for developments gave way to the devolutionary process which we subsequently saw um, throughout the uh, 70s and 80s. The post-Cold Grandin push for devolution, uh, the Constitutional Convention, and then eventually the formation of the Scottish Parliament as we know it today. So my argument is that Brexit represents another moment of Scottish overdevelopment today and another um, dilemma uh, which social leaders will have to face up to do. I think there's two sides for this. First of all, this is rather Brexit, rather like the 1960s, threatens to create great economic stability, uh, instability, sorry. If, um, uh, and secondly, that economic, so, so we have a, a repeat of that 60s, 70s experience where Britain seems to be potentially entering into a moment of decline. At the same time, I think we see the uh, potential for exas the exacerbation of uneven development within the UK, growing regional inequality. Two examples, if growth declines, as I expect it would, after either a hard Brexit or, or a, a different Brexit, tax revenues will fall, 
and disproportionately if weaker regions outside of London and South East and in Scotland are likely to bear the brunt of any retrenchment in the higher railway costs. Secondly, if we look at London's and the South East's export base, it's far more internationalised than the rest of the, the country and the economy. The research from the University of Sheffield shows that quite seven percent uh, London's GDP is dependent on EU demand. Regions outside of London are uh, 50 to 100 percent more dependent on the EU. So a higher rate, I think, could seriously exacerbate uneven development within the EU. Okay. So this creates, I think, an opportunity for Scottish nationalism. It creates the opportunity of the development of overdevelopment. Scottish elites, civil society, parliamentary institutions are far more amenable to continued integration into the European Union and European capitalism as reflected in the 62% vote for Remain. And clearly, certain strategies to use this <coughs> sense that, the, that there's a potential for overdevelopment there to uh, frame our strategy in the present moment. She speaks of Scotland as an open, liberal, cosmopolitan, economically responsible member of the international community. And her strategy really is to try and build support for independence by convincing 2014 no voters, in particular the relatively well off and university educated, that it's worth taking the risk of independence in order to uh, insulate themselves from the threat of Brexit. So will this, to use the title of this panel, lead to the breakup of the Union? Well, of course, it's impossible to tell. But I think there's two reasons to think that Sturgeon's current strategy is risky. First, in 2014, the first independent referendum we saw, the yes vote was bolstered hugely by the turnout of non traditional voting groups and by the traditional working class communities. I think, secondly, so far we haven't seen Middle Scotland move towards support for independence in the polls. I think Sturgeon's attempt to uh, frame Scotland as uh, an overdeveloped site and break free of um, the uh, UK which is heading to Brexit therefore comes with a series of political risks. Um, so the answer to the question of this panel really is we can't know whether it will lead to the break up of the, the union or afraid. There's good reasons to think this uh, certain strategy might not ultimately deliver independence. Um, so that's me. Look forward to this. feeling of horror at the result the morning afterwards rather than a, a sense of where Scottish the Scottish folks they need to win more part of the queer characters of all of this support system. The young and across the United Kingdom voted for the status quo uh, as far as the European Union and that constitutional settlement, but for radical change as far as the status quo as the constitutional settlement between Scotland and the United Kingdom. And then we go to this research associate at Newcastle University and it's going to talk us through that particular puzzle around. Yes. Well, I'm too short for this uh, podium. I thought I did the third platform as a cut, but uh, hopefully it was the only way. Uh, so I'm running people's uh, specialist group, and um, just to give you an idea of what we do, it's a quite diverse uh, group with different interests and methodologies ranging from electoral and explicitly non-electoral political participation, as well as young people's attitudes, ranging all the way to citizenship education. Um, and really the thing that we're with the core that brings us all together is, uh, I guess, a question that many of us wonder sometimes, uh, what are young people's attitudes, political attitudes and behaviours today, and how are they formed? Um, so today, as uh, brilliantly introduced, uh, I'll bring in uh, the youth perspective, the controversial young people, uh, to the potential breaking up of the union. Uh, I'll cover young people's opinions on Brexit, unfortunately, we've heard a lot about that today, but also go back a little bit to the Scottish referendum, uh, and cover Northern Ireland and Wales a little bit, but I'm sure that my panellists on uh, here uh, the panel that are much more eloquent and able to discuss that in more detail than me. The main thing I want you to take away 
uh, is that we can't talk about one group of young people. I think that's the thing uh, that I will try and emphasise more than anything. Oh, there's two of those. Uh, right. So, uh, we're all familiar with these headlines of the young versus the old. Um, uh, so it's the young people who are more radical versus the old conservative people. As young people who voted to, um, who wanted to leave, um, no. uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, in Scotland it was considered uh, as young people who wanted to, uh, they voted for independence, they wanted to leave the UK, uh, but the majority of Scots uh, did it. It was young people who wanted to remain in the EU, but adults and the rest of the UK uh, did it. Uh, it was young people, I won't finish all too much, but please quick. Uh, it was young people who majority voted uh, Labour, whether these were young voters or not. Uh, but adults and the rest of the country did it. So it's young people versus uh, the rest. And for some people, this is great because it means that we're going to have repression and we're going to have change and whatever government we have at the moment, we can look at young people and look to young people to see something about the future. So we're all very familiar with this generational divide, and you know the old saying, if you're not liberal at 25, and uh, you don't have a heart, and if you don't, you're not conservative when you're 35, you don't have a brain. So there's also this thought of uh, are we going from being radical to being more conservative. But is this really so simple? And is it so simple? Because for one, young people voted to remain, to keep the status quo in the rest of the referendum. So is it really that simple? The first answer, the first way to answer this question, uh, it is really to ask ourselves, who is a young person? My main point there is that very often uh, young people are treated as one group, uh, one of the same. Um, and that is uh, like talking 18 to 24 year olds. Um, and theoretically this makes sense, the first time voting, but it's not always accurate. For some young people, uh, now, they might have voted twice by the age they're 24, and uh, come to general elections. Uh, it's even more problematic if we think about the reality of young people's lives. The political identities, they do not start when they turn 18, I'm sure we all have experience of that, but they may not actually start right when they turn 18. Um, and it's already said that the state of youth extends way beyond the age of 24. So, uh, categorizing this group of 18 to 24 of just as the young people just doesn't make any sense. It also doesn't make sense um, in terms of their political opinions. So, this does is a breakdown that we're all familiar with uh, of the, uh, the sort of vote references in the EU referendum. Now, I want to point out something that maybe you don't look at very often, but the biggest differences between the age groups is actually in the youngest age groups. So this also suggests to us that there's much more uh, variation within these age groups than in the older age groups. So from 45, you know, it was pretty it's small differences between uh, the, the 45 and the 65 year olds. So they're much, much bigger between the 18 to 34 year olds. Um, and the one thing to point out, that some uh, people have like pointed out, that when actually come to turning out in the results, <laughs> young people are not just firstly a small cohort than the older baby boomers, but also less likely to be registered to vote. So when we're looking at the actual turnout, we're not really getting young people's opinions. And these two graphs, uh, they're really a bit sort of messy. Um, <laughs> but they're really taking the get that if you look on the left hand side of these uh, scales, that's the younger voters. And then we see a much bigger variation between the top and bottom dots, which is the preference uh, to uh, stay in the uh, EU or not, that we're doing on the right hand side. Uh, so younger people are much more diverse in their political opinions than they are. <coughs> That's kind of what this is suggesting. It's not just a uh, greatest uh, growth score, but it's suggesting that. And actually, when we look at the Scottish independence referendum, <coughs> you see here at the bottom, that the 16 to 24 year olds actually, the majority, um, voted that they didn't want to become independent of uh, the United Kingdom. So it's the 25 to 29 year olds that are the ones that we're talking about when we say that young people wanted to be having independent Scotland. And so what actually happened in Scotland, and here I'm tapping into a bit more of their theme of, of nationalism. 
Actually, there isn't much research on young people's uh, national identities, and I struggled to find information on this because this isn't my uh, normal expertise. Uh, but uh, we have some data on this from Yannick and Edinburgh. And here again, we see the diversification of young people's political attitudes. That the younger young Scots, um, they are considering themselves both British and Scottish, or um, uh, more Scottish, uh, Scottish than British. Whilst the older young people, the green belts on the left hand chart, they are definitely Scottish. So we see a difference in their uh, sort of balance of national identities and also preference of national identities. And similar, we're seeing uh, a difference in their preference with regard to the EU. So the younger young Scots, they wanted to remain, they wanted to keep the status quo. Whilst the slightly older young Scots, they wanted to, um, uh, to remain uh, to <laughs> um, So, why might this be? And that's something that I will come back to. Why might some of the younger young people um, be more in favour of the status quo? Uh, so just to say something quickly about uh, Northern Ireland and Wales, uh, the situation uh, is of course very different. Uh, and as we heard before, uh, the, the uh, situation in Ireland has become very, very acute. But young people, they were they do experience the troubles. They uh, they they haven't had the personal experience, of it. but now the the worry that it's going to kick up again is a real worry for them. Um, in contrast, in Wales, uh, we're seeing some changes. Uh, they're going to introduce Brexit 16 in Spanish. Uh, so. What we're going to see in Wales is there going to be a growth divide uh, between young people and, and attitudes? Or is it going to lead to any total changes? Uh, or are we going to see in Scotland that we're first going to have a bit of a radical move and then move back to the status quo? Um, I'm sure that uh, colleagues will be able to discuss this in more detail, uh, but I also think that the jurors are having this. So, why might we see some differences between young people's political attitudes and why are we seeing that some young people are getting a bit more conservative, not in the ideological sense? Well, first of all, young people are not a homogenous group, also in their experiences of society. There have been a number of very critical moments, political socialization moments. Uh, some people were allowed to vote in the EU referendum, some people were not. Some people were allowed to vote in the Scottish independence uh, referendum, some people were not. And that first hand vote is an important socialisation moment. Um, and depending on where the young people were in their transition into independency, uh, that will affect them differently. So, one of, so where they were when these very important political moments happened, will shape how they see the political world. <clears throat> and also there's an overall mood of uncertainty. We all have, you know, familiar with uh, perhaps some of us more acutely than others, that it's, it's harder to get onto the labour market, it's harder to get a house, and it takes us longer to settle down and move out of our family homes. So this mood of not really knowing what the future holds for you, as, and then the chaos of the politics that we see, I mean, if I just can't really make sense of it, how are young people supposed to make sense of it? So why might some young people be in favour of uh, the status quo? Well, if parents are more conservative, I think parents play a role here. There are more things to talk about around the dinner table. There are much more things to talk about at school. <laughs> uh, so parents might be more likely to socialise their kids um, because there's so much more happening. There's so much more to talk about. Parents are all to the kids. It's, it's a really important socialisation evidence and that shapes their first attitudes, surprise. Um, but also, with the uncertainty of the, the labour markets and, and getting out on the housing ladder, this is speculation. Uh, the good thing is to move out of the family home and then move back in, they're actually subject to the parents' socialisation for longer. So maybe that's why we're seeing the parents' attitudes coming out in young people uh, a little bit more. But also, in this chaos 
of Brexit and ministers resigning and no really knowing what's happening. So maybe it's nice that something just stays the same, right? That's my guess. <laughs> Thank you, that is fascinating. Also, counterintuitive in parts, I really enjoyed that. Um, I guess the big question I have for a lot of people are left with is will the United Kingdom survive Brexit? But, <coughs> yeah, thanks. I don't really have a definitive answer to that question. <laughs> um, and uh, after I listen to uh, the ideas coming from my audience here and how um, I think. Would be uh, the long stretch to, uh, to have an answer. Um, well, I would uh, hear from uh, in the presentations there were uh, several themes I think tied up together quite well, and I think that this will uh, be a short contribution of mine, but at the same time, I feel like you to engage with us uh, for slightly more detail. So, first of all, I think the, uh, the Brexit or the, out the impact of Brexit on people of the United Kingdom has led primarily to uh, 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 more uh, introverts' uh, um, view of their status and your status. Pretty um, So it's inside now to engage uh, for everyone in the UK to engage with what the UK stands for as a political community, as a state, as a union of nations, as a society. And uh, under conditions uh, that we have heard already several decades uh, earlier, uh, which is the second point, when there is no such thing as society, um, there are many more uncertainties about ourselves in this context. So that reflects quite a lot of what we hear from uh, um, the young people uh, in the UK, across the UK, but also what we hear from different parts of the uh, UK. From that particular it's also important. I think these two points together, the first being introverts, uh, UK becoming more introverts, and the second, the increasing number of uncertainties, this is square to the key points of Brexit. Brexit was about making Britain British and uh, making decision making more British. Ultimately, uh, that Britain is the reference point. Of all debates around Brexit. But uh, there is no debate that is constructed, as we have heard from uh, um, Scott. The fact that it only what comes after are uh, rather drawn in, uh, in the dark, in dark colors, in the negative to what should be adopted if the negative scenario uh, materializes. And for many, uh, from most of the contribution that I take home as well is that. Um, UK <coughs> finds itself in a very difficult position of uh, inspiring not only the relationship with many countries in Europe, but also with uh, uh, immediate reference points in its own um, uh, population. People in the UK have seen systematically European Union as a the market for opportunities, as an opportunity for development for cultural enrichment, and many other things that uh, have been taken for granted. And that that results in place to it. I think this is the point that we have heard from both uh, Margaret and uh, uh, But uh, I think the conclusion so that I don't feel that, that ties all of our contributions together is that the EU has worked as a kind of glue both for uh, the constitutional design of this uh, uh, country, for relations, cooperating with them. The United Kingdom political framework for different segments of uh, society that has little awareness of the uh, of, of existence of difference in the UK. And moving towards Brexit underlines the diversity within the UK. That diversity, I think, is that is a challenge and needs to be discussed and debated. We will do see this over the next, well, yeah, six weeks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you uh, very much for all of those uh, yeah, fascinating and in many ways deeply depressing. Uh, I think, yeah, 
I also have to shake the suggestions from the practice circuits that will be very interesting also if you might have to not do it. Uh, and so perhaps we better also look at the circuits. So if we can have a uh, question, they can be uh, directed at, uh, at one panelist or at all of them. Uh, but if they can be questions, uh, we'll be on the full time.